This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for July 27th, 2022. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Today, we're also joined by Judy Currier. Judy is the Chief of Infectious Disease and a Professor of Medicine at UCLA, where she co-directs the Center for AIDS Research and Education. She has served as Chair of the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, the ACTG, an international consortium sponsored by the NIH for the past five years. As the name suggests, the ACTG has focused on improving the diagnosis and treatment of HIV infection. But since the onset of COVID-19, the ACTG has also been deeply involved in research on this new outbreak. Judy, before we talk about COVID research though, tell us how the ACTG works. Well, thank you. The ACTG is an international group of clinical and translational investigators who are funded by the Division of AIDS and NIAID to conduct interventional clinical trials on HIV and related infections. And currently, the work of the ACTG is focused on five main areas, HIV cure, antiretroviral therapy strategies, hepatitis B, tuberculosis, and HIV comorbidities. The group was recently refunded in 2020 for seven years and includes 53 clinical research sites located in 16 countries. We have a robust uh, group of investigators, engaged community members, site staff, and others who all work together, setting our agenda, leading, and running our clinical trials. Um, A key other part of our network is the Statistical and Data Management Center at Harvard, and as well as a laboratory center that includes specialty labs focused on the different domains of our research agenda. And how did you and the ACTG get involved in COVID research? So when COVID was first reported back in January 2020, immediately many of our investigators were asking, what can we do to help? We have sites, we have locations and all over the place. Everybody is trying to figure out how we should manage and treat this disease. Uh, We're in the outpatient setting. You know, what can we do? So we started sort of pestering about what we could do. Uh, People came up with with concepts they wanted to see developed. And we put together a study very quickly, uh, an outpatient study, initially focused on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin to try to determine whether it had any activity. We were very successful in in getting that study launched due to really lack of interest from the site, from people with COVID at that time, but we had a protocol written. And I was appointed to the therapeutics working group of the NIH Accelerating COVID Therapeutics and Vaccines, also known as ACTIVE by Francis Collins. And on that group, decision was made to develop a platform trial for outpatients and one for inpatients. So the ACTG proposal for the outpatient platform trial was submitted to this group and it was accepted for development. And that happened in June of 2020. That outpatient platform study was developed and opened on August 8th of 2020. So it was very rapidly developed. And the initial goal was to study monoclonal antibodies for outpatient, early outpatient treatment of COVID. So that's how we got involved in the very beginning. Judy, it's interesting that it was a little slow to get off the ground. And I think that was true for a lot of COVID research at the very beginning of the epidemic. Looking back, what do you think we might have done differently? Yeah, I think that preparation ahead of time, knowing that we were in a position to be called upon to do this work and having a plan in place that when something happened, we would, you know, we would hit go and we'd be ready to go. I think knowing that, you know, one of the things that takes a long time for COVID took a long time to get the studies open, especially in the outpatient setting was nobody had any place to see people with COVID. You know, everyone was told to stay home, the general kind of acceptance of the need for any treatment at all early in disease. It was, it was really, uh, it took a lot of preparation to get these outpatient sites ready to see people with COVID. And we actually ended up building outpatient pod units and many of our sites got these pods and, and were able to, to use them. And I, and I think it's so important because you know, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about monkeypox today, but 
our pods, they were talking about decommissioning them in the spring of this year as the number of people we were seeing for outpatient infusions was down. And I said, absolutely not. We, we need to keep these. We, we don't know what's coming in the future. And we also don't think COVID is over yet. And so I think having the facilities for seeing a respiratory or any kind of infection that's uh, transmitted is, is critical. So that was really one stumbling block. The other is funding. You know, you, we can't just ask people to do a lot of work and not pay for it, especially when it involves hiring new people and, you know, getting things going. I think being able to utilize personnel that are in place is great, but there's a lot of things that have to be Employed to get a study started, and you need funding for that. And you know the agility of being able to use funding that was intended for one purpose for another is not as easy as it should be. So I think that's also kind of been part of the delay with monkeypox is like figuring out where the funding is going to come from to do uh, trials of monkeypox. So just to push a little bit more on Eric's comment, and Eric and I have debated this before about. Things happen faster than they ever did before, but yet they happened way too slow. And so the other side of the glass half empty, the glass half full, Judy, what worked well in 2020 that enabled things to happen faster than they ever did before? And how do we build on that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I do, I do want to agree with you that while, you know, we've never been able to do anything as that fast, we need to be able to work faster. So I, I absolutely agree. But in retrospect, what I think helped was that everything else was shut down. And so people were able to pivot to doing something else, drop everything and work on it. And as we have, you know, new crises where everything's not shut down, we see the strain that that creates. So, so that was one thing. And then also people were already in place all around the country and the world at places that did outpatient clinical research. The infrastructure was all there and could be, I don't want to say repurposed, but, you know, utilized quickly. But we need to have a little bit of excess capacity to be able to do that and not lose the momentum of everything else that we're doing. Because, you know, as we saw, so many problems with management and treatment of other diseases, tuberculosis treatment, you know, all the disruptions that, that occurred in, in, in that and HIV care delivery uh, with the pandemic. So we can't you know, just pull people away from doing other jobs, but we can potentially enhance what's there and, and make it move quicker. Let me follow up on that because one of the jobs that a lot of the people had who were involved in these studies is actually taking care of patients. And it was the very same infectious disease physicians and nurses who were involved in the studies who needed to see this huge increase in volume, that must have posed a huge problem. Yeah, it, absolutely. And, and also lab techs, you know, the lab techs um, working in the, you know, everybody was suddenly doing COVID testing. And that was another, uh, another part of the workforce that was really being pulled into different pieces. So that was a problem for sure. Judy, you mentioned monkeypox. So how do we use the existing infrastructure, ACTG and other, to deal with this new threat? Well, for monkeypox, I think in terms of research, I think we can use this infrastructure for conducting outpatient clinical trial. And I think we need one desperately to figure out whether Tecoviramet has activity that we think it has. So uh, the ACTG is at this moment working on developing a study to implement with Tecoviramet at our sites. It's moving very quickly. We just got notice that they had identified funding for us to be able to do this. And we're working hard to get the study out into the field, hopefully within the next month or so. And as studies like this launch, Judy, how does it integrate with global efforts to look at new treatments for new diseases? Now you could say it's uh, an old disease, but as monkeypox has emerged as a health threat, how do we work with our global partners? And that's a really important point. And I think there's been a, a big effort to coordinate among studies that are being done, sharing of protocols, discussions. I know there was a, a meeting that you might have been involved in just recently discussing uh, approach to monkeypox therapeutics with uh, other global partners at WHO and in Europe. And the efforts of these studies are they're being shared. And I think the leadership of the groups are talking with each other regularly about their efforts. 
I do think, you know, one thing, just going back to COVID, we started out with a plan for our studies to be global, using global sites from the different networks. And we were able to include sites outside the U.S., but the regulatory timelines for ex-U.S. participation really, really slowed us down. And while we saw some of the benefits of single IRB in the U.S., being able to very quickly get sites open and, and IRB approved outside the U.S., it took much longer. And I think that's an area where we really need to pay some attention in the future to being able to deploy trials across the globe more rapidly. But Judy, I, I see a tension here in that when COVID emerged, as you alluded to, there were challenges even in having diagnostics to know who had it and how to see volunteers and how we just trafficked in our communities. We also had an explosion of ideas as to how to treat it, with many small studies at individual centers emerging. How do we think about these smaller sort of exploratory studies with these larger network or collaborative studies that have greater power but can focus only on one or two concepts at a time. Yeah, I think it just needs to be a better process of integration of what's going on and, you know, more clear plan that is communicated about the fact that there is a plan and there's an effort in place. I think early on people felt like there wasn't a plan, so they started just trying whatever they were able to try and, and trying to collect information about it. The active partnership really tried to pull together industry and different groups so that there was some coordination. You know, it started in April of 2020. And I think if it had been in place before the pandemic and it had been ready to go right in the beginning, we might have eliminated some of that confusion about who was doing what. But I think that just needs to be central coordination around the activities and getting different institutes to work together and pharma to come to the table as well. Because we did have some challenges of trying to develop studies really quickly with pharma and then pharma decide to do it on their own after we put in a fair amount of time. So that wasn't well coordinated. And I think just deciding what's going to be done by the pharmaceutical industry, what's going to be done by the government, and then just divide up and go, we could save a lot of time that way. In some ways, it's easier when there is someone in industry involved who has a product because they have control over that product. When it came to things like off-label usage of existing drugs, there were millions of studies done independently by different research groups, most of which ended up being too small to give any answers. So that represents a considerable challenge trying to coordinate among those kinds of groups. Yeah, I think that everybody was trying to do something. And I think maybe being able to identify the different types of funding and divide things up and to sort of say who's going to look at repurposed drugs and who's going to look at new chemical entities and you know what role our existing networks going to play and what what's going to be done by pharma the other thing that happens with the pharma studies is they go to the sites where the networks are and then, then they're competing studies at the same site so there's more than enough places to do this work and I think that was the other thing that that we saw is that we you know we need an expanded footprint around the country. We need to make sure that we have studies you know, in, in, in all regions serving all parts of the population and, and not just at you know, academic health centers, but at community centers uh, around the country as well. And so that, that was, uh, I think, an important lesson learned. And, and I think we learned from what was done in the UK with the recovery group, what's been done in countries like Qatar and Israel that have national healthcare databases, there are a lot of different ways to gain systematic knowledge, but I think the prospective therapeutic intervention requires an infrastructure to facilitate rapid scale up and study. And in part, Judy, what you're saying is that's what NIH or NIAID, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, had in place were networks with highly skilled sites that could help deploy rapidly these studies, and we can argue it needs to be even more rapidly because we have a lot to improve on, but it built on a high quality infrastructure. Yeah, and it wasn't just at NIAID, also NHLBI had networks of people doing cardiovascular disease that got repurposed for COVID, the emergency, you know, siren network, uh, other pulmonary critical care networks. So 
it is uh, just trying to figure out how to coordinate it all together. I think that was the biggest challenge. And we learned, I, I think what we saw, you know, happen in the UK was how they were able to organize the studies very rapidly and everyone participate. You know, it was a real strength. And I think we learned a lot from those studies. So given all of this, what, Judy, do you see as the big questions that need to be addressed in terms of vaccines and therapeutics? And what questions can best be approached through large multicenter clinical trials? Yeah, well, I'll I maybe stay away completely from the whole vaccine question. I mean, clearly we need better vaccines. And I think that that effort, it's not clear where that's going in terms of where those studies are going to be done or how they're going to be done. But, you know, the unprecedented uh, rapidity with which the vaccines uh, we got information on was a, that was just really, I think, one of the high points of COVID, how quickly that happened. And I, I would add that many of these sites that were involved in our outpatient trial were also doing vaccine trials at the same time, sort of further utilizing this, this infrastructure. But, but in the area of therapeutics, I think there's a couple of things that I hope that we can continue to learn more about. And one is treating the severely immunosuppressed host um, in early disease. We don't yet have any data on the value or benefit of combination therapy. We may need treatments that act in, in more than one way to really control infection in people with severe immunosuppression. We need additional oral therapies, I think, with fewer drug interactions, and we need to determine the optimal duration of treatment. While the monoclonal antibodies um, certainly had some challenges with respect to resistance, the one thing about treatment with monoclonals is that half-life for these drugs is very long. And you know, we don't see these rebounds when people are treated with longer acting therapy. So I think we need to figure that out. And there are other drugs in development that are moving ahead. So we should have other options. It's just been really challenging with a changing virus, a changing pandemic, and a changing population, that it's very hard to do non-inferiority studies when you don't know the expected rate of response to your, your so-called control group. So that's been something that's really, really hindered us. And then I think we need to know whether early treatment prevents longer sequelae of COVID, long COVID. And I think that will be an important endpoint to be included in future early treatment studies. And then obviously we need to figure out how to manage, how to prevent and, uh, and treat long COVID. And there is a big effort underway with the RECOVER project uh, at, at NIH. And they are gonna be, I think, looking into clinical trials for that population as well. The long COVID population uh, that you're just talking about, Judy, is a complicated one in that there are many different apparent syndromes that people uh, have developed. We've talked about recover before on this podcast. Certainly a challenge for any therapeutic trials is going to be defining those subpopulations so that you can see reasonable signals. As you look toward constructing those trials, you see good pass forward? I think so. I think that the efforts to really define the components of the syndrome are making some progress. And I also think that, you know, hopefully we're going to have some data from longer term follow up of some of the early studies that were started in COVID, where people are randomized from the time they have COVID. I think it gives you a lot of power to look at differences in their outcomes, even as the definition is being really pulled together. And it, and it can, I think that some of the definitions are based really on functional status without necessarily defining the underpinnings of, of what's causing it, but just how the person is able to feel and function. And we may learn something about that, but I agree it is a very complex area to study as it's still being defined. Getting back to lessons learned, could we change our research infrastructure to make it better able to respond to the next pandemic? And if we can, should we? Uh, yeah, I think we can, and I think we should. And I think, um, one of the things that we need to do is to just decide that we're going to have a plan and, and certain groups are going to be deployed, almost like the uh, Medical National Guard, Research National Guard, where it's known ahead of time that this is part of what you're going to do. And it's built into the way that things are structured and funded so that there's the capacity to mobilize quickly. 
And also, I think being able to bring different groups together to work together is also something that could happen. But it, I think, needs to come from the top. And I think people will, will participate. The thing that really struck me during this was the commitment of all of the people working at these sites to want to be involved and do something from our community, community advisory board members to our site staff, everywhere along the chain, people working on regulatory and finance, you know, not just the investigators, but everyone you know, really put their oars in the water and said, what, you know, what do I do? How can I help? And that was really great to see that kind of collaboration and teamwork that was necessary. And I think, as Lindsay said earlier, you know, some things did happen at record speed. And I know many of us are wishing that that wouldn't have ended, but, <laughs> but it did. But we saw that it's possible, you know, and I think we can do better. And I think there's a, a pathway to making that happen. So, Judy, in terms of how to organize something with a forward-looking vision for the next pandemic, be it monkeypox or beyond. Where should that sit? Who should be the convener? Well, I guess for things that are you know, funded through the NIH, it would potentially come from within the NIH working together with the CDC and and other groups. You know, I think that probably makes the most sense that it, that it come from within the leadership of those groups. And that's how ACTIVE started. It was, you know, Francis Collins who really put that group together initially with others. So I think it was a good approach and I think it can be built on it. I think there people are discussing how to build on it. I, I know all of us who are in different networks are wondering how we'll be able to participate in the future or what our role is, but I think there's a lot of interest in making that happen. And not just in the US, but around the world. It sounds as if what you're talking about is a somewhat different model from what we have right now, although not crazily so. ACTG is set up to do any number of studies within a certain area. What you're talking about is creating a research capacity that's ready to pounce at a moment, but doesn't necessarily have research questions in front of it at any given moment. So it means funding some what I think you called excess capacity. So that would be a very different model, I think, for the, for the NIH, although I agree with you, it's really important. Yeah, I think it is very hard with the funding constraints to put money somewhere that isn't going to be used immediately. But maybe just having more flexibility and being able to expand. And even, you know, I've been thinking about just within my own hospital and division, you know, just having people who can be deployed to help move away from other types of jobs. We just, we just don't, you know, we just really don't have enough staff. Um, and, and it's only worse now after COVID. I think the great resignation, you know, there's so many people who have just stepped away and it's really getting harder to hire people. So we need to keep at that. But I think we're talking about something even bigger, Eric, in the sense that, and I wonder if high up in HHL, HHS, Health and Human Services, because this affects not only the NIH and uh, the science that it does, it affects CDC with the public health. It affects FDA with the regulatory. It affects BARDA and other investments the government makes in countermeasures. Because the idea that the countermeasure is sitting on my shelf right now waiting to be deployed. And it affects, you know, as you allude to, Judy, laboratory programs. You know, we forget that the first six months of 2020, we had incredible difficulty even diagnosing COVID because of the diagnostic tools had to be developed, approved, and scaled up. For us to properly respond as a community, it actually does require a very high-level leadership to bring together these very disparate groups that actually are working together from different perches and have that sense of urgency. You know, Lindsay, what you're describing is very much the model of what people think about for the CDC, which does have the capacity for rapid deployment or should have the capacity for rapid deployment. Of course, that got tested during uh, this epidemic, and it was shown that we didn't have the capacity we thought we did, um, certainly at the beginning of the epidemic. Extending that to research is a fairly different model, but I think a very attractive one. Yeah, I think that is definitely a CDC doesn't do research for treatment, like evaluate treatments. And it's kind of where this gap is and how to make that gap between what they do and what, what NIH does 
filled uh, more seamlessly, I think is something we were, I think people are working on trying to figure out and, and maybe now with monkeypox, we'll see that happening more. I mean, an important dimension to this is the industry element, because to go to scale, we have to have a treatment that we think has benefit. We have to be able to demonstrate that. And then if it worked, how do you have a million or a billion doses, depending on what the nature of the treatment is? So there are many moving parts I think we have to pull together in a way where all groups have reasonable incentives to engage. Otherwise, it will sound nice, but not necessarily have the ability to move forward with the speed that we all think we need. Yeah, I think one thing, too, with the government purchasing the medication for distribution, it also needs to be included in that plan, the permission to use it for research, in that not all of the questions are going to be answered by the first study that's done that leads to the emergency use approval. And being able to have access to the drug to be able to do additional studies, I think would really be beneficial. And Judy, I think that speaks to Tecrovirumat for monkeypox. You know, there was an investment over the last decade to bring it forward with appropriate manufacturing, animal studies, and certain human studies demonstrating PK that's favorable, as well as the in vitro studies. Now we're at a position of how do we develop clinical evidence of efficacy? And with that, there is the, how do we use it? You know, who holds the IND? Who has permission to be able to use it in what format, particularly in a way that's systematic to generate a high quality knowledge? And I think that is a problem that takes more time than we want in terms of solving so we can do the studies. Yeah, I think that it was known that a clinical study was going to be needed for this medication at some point, and it probably could have been ready to go. <laughs> and so that's just a, it's easy to say in hindsight, but I think thinking about these things and what are the, what are the studies and how are they going to need to be done and can we be more prepared to have them ready to launch? Thank you, Judy, for joining us today. And thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.